Hi, everybody. Ilya Marachnik here with another New Masters Academy critique during the coronavirus quarantine. I hope everyone is staying as safe as possible, social distancing, and just doing what we're all trying to do, and uh, just g get out of this so we can resume our lives, our jobs, our careers, and uh, get out of it with our health. I wish that to everyone. Before we jump into this critique, I would like to remind you that New Masters Academy has made the beginning drawing class available for free online. These critiques as well are available to anyone who wants to submit their pieces for critique by either myself or, um, or uh, one of the other New Masters Academy instructors. You do not need to be a paying subscriber for that to happen. You just need to make an account and upload your pieces. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that if you're currently enrolled in an art school um, that has gone online, speak to your administrators because New Masters Academy is working with schools and educational, uh, offering educational group accounts. The idea here is to help with the challenges of online learning, remote learning. So um, the other thing, the final thing I'd like to mention before we jump into this critique is that um, if you are a paying subscriber to New Masters Academy, uh, and even if you're not yet, do check out the coaching program. Um, the coaching program, um, of which I am a part, is an opportunity to not simply watch the courses, do all the assignments, which is, of course, a lot, um, a, a lot as it is, but um, to also be able to have um, guidance from one of the, from one of the coaches in, in uh, moving your progress along, in developing a portfolio, so on and so forth. So definitely check that out. With that, let's jump in to this week's critique. So this cloth study was brought to us by Maritun J. Varun. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. And um, I'm particularly interested in critiquing this because of the, the, uh, the, the part of my new master's course that deals with cloth um, is particularly important to me because I think um, I, I think it's very good. Um, if I could say so myself, of course, um, I don't, uh, you know, I am like most artists hard on myself, but, uh, I do think that that one turned out quite well. We really get into cloth, um, explain different types of, uh, of cloth structures, principles, and then of course reinforce light shadow and all that stuff. So, uh, definitely look, look out for that, um, when it comes out. So the first thing I'm gonna do is probably tighten these edges because uh, I think that they're a little soft on that side. Um, I don't think we need to be so soft. I don't know. And so we can just sort of make this kind of do a little bit of that. There's some recordings. Uh, and just do a little bit of that and so on, right? So that uh, already kind of locks in this triangular shape a little bit more. Right here, actually, I kind of like that uh, that softness, and then we can go sharp again towards the bottom, and then we're good. So what I think we could do is just in general, the lighter values, right? And now I'm not talking about cloth. I'm just talking about the lighter values seem to me uh, just a little too... Just a little lighter than they need to be. So actually, I'm going to do it this way. I'm just going to... Some of the lighter values seem too light. Right? So I'm just going to do something like this, right? Kind of... And then a few saturation brightness. And then I'm just going to tone them down just a bit. I want to keep the background as is, but I'd like to knock down the values a little bit. Mainly because I want to have tonal room, right? And that's... And tonal room is important to me. Uh, because I'd like to show some brighter areas, as for example here, right? 
over here, right? And that already kind of gives you that extra sort of umph in the cloth. Now, uh, I'm gonna switch to something a little bit more, uh, a little bit softer, I think, sketching. The soft pastel is a, sort of a fan of it, right? It gives you a nice texture. So, what is the thing that we need to concern ourselves with when dealing with cloth? The first thing is grouping your values, right? Don't allow your reflected, the lights, uh, the reflected lights in the shadows to be too strong. And I know sometimes it's hard to, hard to avoid because of how, um, of how intense those lights might look, mainly because of the, of the, the color and reflective nature of the fabric, right? So begin by just blocking them in so all of this stuff within the claw within within the cloth itself in that shadow could all be made much more solid right and in general i would recommend this i'm, I'm making it a little bit cooler i don't think that's necessary that's just what's happening but all those dark lines that are essentially occlusion shadows right they're just caused because the the cloth is like falling in on itself and no lights allowed in that's something to just unify a little bit more. Keep those shadows contained. Keep them a little more solid. Um, and notice how already it's beginning to define that form. I would say even a similar thing for everything on this side, right? Just knock that back. A similar thing can happen right here. And then, of course, I darkened everything, but I don't think we need to go that dark in this large uh, this large gap, right? So we can kind of give some air there, atmosphere it out, right? Because we do need to focus on the folds. Um, the folds themselves, I think, are interestingly observed. They're sort of accurate in a lot of ways. The problem that I was mentioning before had to do with not having, giving yourself enough tonal room to really model that cloth. The thing to keep in mind, primarily, right, aside from all of those aspects of uh, what kind of, you know, what, what the angle is, is it a zigzag fold, is it a half lock, um, all that stuff, which I cover in the course. The thing here is that there's one major principle, and that is that the forms are tubular, right? That's pretty much all they are, if they're just left hanging. And then, if there's going to be any change of direction, they have to come together converge, squeeze in something called the eye, and and then expand again if they're changing direction. And it's this angle that's creating the zigzag or, or you know, half lock or any of those other ones. It's the angle at the eye. Now, and the eye, is usually right now we can get to the actual like just the general feeling of highlight um right obviously the amplitude kind of look how wide this bit of uh this bit of um cloth is is allowing that highlight to dissipate and then it becomes a stronger tighter more sort of a line of a highlight at the uh eye of the fold because of course uh, just it's smaller, uh, you know, and so it's going to be uh, the angle of the rotation, right? The amplitude of it is going to be smaller, and so uh, the highlight will appear sharper. That's what we need to worry about. And so a lot of these eyes have been identified, right? I see, and there's something interesting about what's happening here is because, uh, and I do mention this a lot in the in the course, right? I talk about the, that that there are particular periods of time that uh, artistic in artistic history that preferred one type of cloth structure over another and this is interesting this currently reminds me of something from from um the gothic period or uh maybe at the latest the northern renaissance right where um the it's also a type of fabric too, right? Where you have these very sharp changes of direction. And so you're seeing them as really, really angular. And those angles are shown even more by the reflective property of the cloth, right? 
there's something about that that's happening here. So I'm basically, what I'm doing is amplifying those changes in direction along the eyes. Also, slightly reducing the values um, on some of those half tones in the in the sort of the, the, the sort of the cavities that don't necessarily fall into shadow. I, I'm not changing the cloth really. I'm just essentially just pumping up the highlights. And I'm keeping I'm getting a little more of a gradient. I'm sort of keeping this area our main area of focus, our main source of uh of light and all that stuff. So not source of light, but our main. Uh, well, actually, on the on the paper, that would be our main source of light, right? Of course, our light's elsewhere, but that would be our main uh, sort of area of contrast and light in general. So that's kind of all I need to do here. I think that's pretty much everything. I also think it's important to figure out what's going on in terms of core and cast shadow, right? So the core shadows, I would purposefully push the softness and sharpen the cast shadows, right? Because that's really giving you this form. What that allows you to see is um, what's really going on with that cloth. And then of course, now that this is all unified, in one or two places, we can begin pulling out some of those occlusion shadows where you need them, right? I'm gonna say right here, perhaps, right? Where that's sort of, Kind of hinting at that change of direction at the um, at the elbow, somewhere up here to lock in the form of the arm. But you don't need to, them to kind of follow the form for too long. You don't need them to wrap around for too long. Then this is a nice sort of dark area we can add there, and so on. Right, so. Then I'm gonna clean up the edges a little bit more. So if you see, it just kind of brings your attention to places, unifies those shadows a little bit more. Um, and the great thing that could be done here at this point, right? And obviously this is just a sort of a short critique, is now we can really get into small and somewhat accidental changes, right? Like something like this could be happening. How important is that? Not really, right? But at the same time, something to think about, right? What is the what is the real change there, right? Um, how, what is the real lock of the form in this area? How does this wrap around? maybe one or two of these is actually a dark occlusion shadow, right? Like really modeling one or two specific parts and getting them filled with accidents, right? And this is, by accident, I mean things that are not the most of, of the most fundamental essential nature, right? What I mean by that is that the big tubular form, the type of, the type of cloth formation, the um, organization of the eye and the highlight in relation to it is one thing. But then there are all these small changes and those are the ones which will really make this come alive. Those are the ones that um, can really bring that, and you don't need them everywhere by the way, right? You need them just in some places. Um, here, it would be nice to kind of follow that. This is a long zigzagging pattern. That could be nice. Maybe some larger, um, lighter areas underneath a major form so that we can get a flatter plane happening there. Um, keep in mind that the cloth is generally tubular, but also there are inverted tubes which happen in areas like this where uh, you have uh, folds that go like this, right? So you're gonna have something that looks right, like that, and they fold over one another and they keep moving like that. But keep in mind that this top plane is still tubular, you're just seeing the inside of it, right? This top plane flattens out because um, 
it's flat and then it 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 it, uh, it moves down uh, a little bit and so in general you're focused on finding uh the uh, tubular form of each bit of fabric but at times you have to look and establish certain concavities um like here for example which i think is being done actually fairly well in this in this uh exercise here so i think that this is a great job um i hope that my uh my comments kind of uh can help set you in the right direction. And uh, in general, I do believe that you can probably teach most of the principles uh, of light, of shadow, of structure, uh, using cloth alone. And this is why I recommend everyone can go and just hang up a piece of fabric on a chair in their house and just sketch the hell out of it. I assure you, you... Uh, you only you only gain from it. Okay, let's move on. So this image, uh, this painting, uh, was brought to us by Kara Crisp, and um, I think there's a lot of good stuff going on here. So let's get into it, though. There are a few things which um, I have some hesitations about. In general, I like. Um, certain chromatic things happening uh let me see painting whatever uh it doesn't really matter so much just pick a brush that looks good to me okay so but the basic idea is compositionally i'm seeing a few things that are sort of causing me to uh, to think about these things basically the way this is composed is you have a horizontal, a horizontal, horizontals everywhere here, right? On top, the top edge, everything is horizontal. And then the trees, the palm trees, very familiar to me now that I live in Florida, um, ex you know, are the sort of counterbalance being a vertical counterbalance. The only diagonal action is sort of this line of what looks like kind of the ground against the, uh, the mountains in the background. And all of these uh, have all of these sort of diagonals of the mountains on top. Compositionally, this is this can work. I do think um, maybe we can push and pull some things, regardless of how they uh, they looked in uh, in real life, right? So let's start with that, and then we'll move on from there. Basically, I'm not so sure. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm not so sure this would be too much of an issue if in some places, right, we could have just moved some of the mountains down a bit more. Maybe this whole side comes down. Maybe this comes down and back up a little bit more. Uh, simply to, to break up the horizontality of the top of the mountains, right, to kind of push that diagonal quality that's already in them a little bit more. In general, I'm kind of a big fan of the way the contrasts are controlled here, right? The mountains are, you get to see light and shadow, and yet the contrasts are reduced, so that's pretty good. What I am concerned about is um, these, these things right here, which all seem a little bit uh, darker than they need to be, uh, and also a little bit repetitive, kind of like squares, Kind of moving along the same vertical, um, the same vertical st structure across the uh, page as the palm trees are, but we'll get there. So a little bit more also in some places here, right? Just kind of a breaking up even the diagonals. What if the diagonals were also like so some of them are like the one the few diagonals that exist in the actual, like the ground, are maybe also a little bit too simplistic. Maybe sometimes they can come up a little bit. Maybe the mountains come down a little bit more. Right? Just pushing and pulling these, these movements. I also think uh, possibly maybe we can 
clean out this area right here, right? Maybe that um, needs to, to be a little bit of a pause in that sort of very repetitive and sort of modular vertical movement, right? Everything is sort of like if I, if I take, right, everything is kind of equal and all these distances are within a range, right? But sometimes we can push and pull them to have uh, a greater pause, right? Maybe then we can add one back in. And now we have the group right here is sort of crowded. Then there's a pause, like a large break between them, small break between them, a couple of palms right there, and then a break again, right? So just one or two, and just cleaning up a few spots might be quite helpful. Um, and that is, of course, uh, that. Now, I would then keep that as your main horizontal, but then down here, with those reflections in the water, that too, can, we can play around with that, right? We can sort of just extend some of this out more. Uh, you know, who, who, who knows how it actually was, right? But that's sort of the main key, right? Maybe I'm exaggerating those reflections, uh, bringing them down a little bit more kind of finding a shape to them, some patterns to them that maybe it will be a little bit more dynamic in allowing us to kind of, uh, kind of allowing our eye to move up and then up again, and up again, something like that. Um, okay, then I'm thinking, what if we just slightly reduce some of these contrasts of those I guess they're, I guess they're plants of some sort, right? So we can just slightly tone them back. It wouldn't hurt, for sure. Um, and that already, I think, kind of begins to, to, even at this point, right? Very minor changes, but they're sort of breaking apart some of the, um, the very tricked horizontal and uh, vertical action. I would also potentially right, add a palm tree lower right lower than the other one so far that also helps move us a little bit more diagonally across the space this right here is actually pretty good maybe that is a small palm tree and then we can we can pull that down a little bit who knows and i mean there are small palm trees then the the beach itself I'm not so happy with this sort of arc that I'm seeing here. So maybe the beach itself comes out a little bit more. You could see more of the sand also kind of cutting into our foreground a little bit more. Maybe it cuts into the greens a little bit more as well, right? They're, they shouldn't all be equal. Small stuff can be quite instrumental in how we perceive the whole. All right, and then just lock that in a little bit darker lines. And now, some changes, some changes to our general values. What I'm seeing is a little bit of a, a repetition, right? Like if you look, the sky and the water reflection are kind of the same value. And in some ways, the same color. Now, this is a hard one, right? Basically, values in reflections all uh, kind of new, kind of uh, neutralize, aim towards a mid-tone. So the dark values become lighter, light values become darker uh, in general. So why don't we play around with this? Why not just take some of this? Huh. We can do it that way, but, but that's not. Um, this would be faster. Right? Why don't we just take the water and this whole area of water and slightly darken it, just slightly, right? Why don't we take the sky and introduce a hint of some other color? My concern with the sky is if it looks, at least, of course, this is a photo, right? So it's not so clear. There's a hint of purple there, but in general, it looks like a blue diluted with some, uh, uh, with titanium, um, with, uh, you know, just a, White titanium, uh, titanium white of some sort. It might not be titanium, but it does look opaque, so that's why I go. There's also uh, 
a tendency uh, for painters to call colors not by the color name but by the uh, but by the uh, the name of the uh, the petal or pigment that is uh, making them. I'm gonna just warm it up. Right? I think why not? Well, if I can just add a hint of something warmer into the sky, and then possibly bring that warmth along with its light into the upper edge of the mountains, right? Allowing that light to kind of swallow up that edge there, maybe a little bit, right? Kind of pushing that atmospheric perspective a little bit. Um, that could be a fun thing to do. I also think uh, that that being what it is, um, we're, all, we're already kind of differentiating from the top and the, the push of that atmosphere and the closeness of the reflections in like right that's the other thing you don't want the foreground to be the same as the background and there isn't anything that is this is the most foreground and this is the most background thing you have here right everything is so this is an important distinction to make so the water might be a darker value but the contrasts in the water are greater than those in the mountains right that's what I'm trying to get at here. Th this whole area right here though, I would slightly reduce, right? Because the blacks there are becoming, are becoming a little bit uh, overpowering, at least in this, in this um, image. Right? And, and by that, I mean, of course, the, the, uh, the actual uh, image uh, that I'm looking at the upload. I'm certain the, Colors in the painting are more complex. Everything is much more nuanced and so on. Now, the one thing I want to do, though, see, I'm not changing too much. I'm just kind of regulating some things. I don't feel like there's a need to really re re redo all this. I feel like maybe the wall here right, it could also show some variation. Possibly this area right here should be catching the largest amount of light, whereas on the corners, we can kind of slightly knock knock that back just a bit. Also introducing some cooler colors, and it could also work potentially even, and I don't know if this is happening, that this could work potentially even showing cast. Uh, maybe there's kind of a cast shadow on the wall from some of the trees. Now, that, of course, will create some problems because that just over... Uh, powers and just keeps pushing those verticals but we could kind of lie and maybe um, show those shadows maybe in some cases a little bit more diagonally sometimes and that also maybe can can uh, slightly break apart the um, the, uh, the extremely pervasive uh, horizontal and vertical qualities here. I would bring this, if that's a palm tree as well, I would bring this up higher so that it becomes a darker value against the light value of the mountain there. And I would maybe carve in here as well, just a little bit so that we have um, also a dark value against the light value or, uh, right there. And I think it just helps to create that bit of contrast to set those mountains even uh, like totally behind the the contrast of the trees and the uh, the building that we're looking at. That's basically what I'm trying to do here. But the one last thing I'm gonna to try to do is maybe what if we take the mountain and what if we um, what if we uh, slightly brighten them up, uh, kind of reducing the contrast just that bit, just that extra bit right there. Maybe the other thing to do is to try to even view the warmer parts as cooler than what they appear as here, right? They'll still look warm compared to the shadows that are a blue, but in general, um, right, we need to allow that atmosphere to eat up everything in the back and of course the further things get the cooler they'll be um and that is uh
just something to think about. Though now the best thing to do would be maybe to then play around with putting certain accents. Maybe we can then show bits of light in places and sort of increase that light, warm up some of these areas. That did not work up here. Warm the warm some of these things up a bit more. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to change too much. These are just a few ideas um, on the topic of like how to kind of make this something more than a sketch, right? That's the distinction, making it more of a completed painting, if you will. And that's sort of a hard distinction to, uh, to classify. And I think um, one way of looking at it is like, if you look at the, the Impressionists and then of course, at the Japanese artists that they were looking at, you're really seeing um, the immense amount of attention paid to how to really compose that environment and scene in terms of uh, lines, as well as color and uh, atmosphere and all this. And right, and the way they do it, it looks like a scene. It's never just um, a moment quickly captured. Often we are taught that the Impressionists aimed to simply capture a moment. I think that's more of an aspect of like a character of light or something like this. But I think in terms of how structured the compositions are, they're, they're never accidental. That's not to say that there's not something to be, uh, to be said about going out and painting just a scene, a fragment. But I was trying here, I think this was aiming to be more of a completed piece, a part of an environment, uh, kind of uh, becoming an environment of its own than simply a captured fragment of a scene. And I think just by tweaking things here and there, I think we moved it in that direction. Okay, with that, let's move on. So this image is brought to us by my name, Patricia. Uh, and um, I think this is a good way forward from our previous painting, right? That was a landscape. Here we have the complex interaction of an interior and a landscape. And the difficulty lies with values, right? So here are a few options. Some of them, and it's this is the hard part, right? On the one hand, um, what's potentially happening is that you want to show um, the light outside and some of the light hitting inside. For this, we'll probably have to tone down everything inside. So we can just begin with something like this. Now, is this the color I want? Maybe not, right? Maybe it could be a little bit more, a little bit more cool. And we can add some of those cools into here, right? And especially because we don't want like the super strong chromatic contrast between the outside and the inside, right? I, I personally don't think that's the best way to go. I think there should be some sort of chromatic unity, but tonal contrast. Now, let's not say that's exclusively the only way to go. Um, what also I'm trying to achieve is a unification right, of some of the stuff indoors. Now, not all of it necessarily becomes a clear darker value, but at least to some degree, it becomes uh, unified in a way where we do not look inside, but look outside. This is how I would approach it, right? I would, even all of this, the cupboards here, and that's fine. It's very powerful to paint like detailed in the darker values. This is not that, uh, this is sort of a more tonalist approach, and that's the one I think we're going to, uh, to take here. And then, of course, our light inside is so much more controlled, right? Our light inside is right there, and that really has a strong effect. I would probably take some of this um, and push it even more, right? Even knocking back the, all of this, getting rid of some of these corners. 
All right, that's how I would go about this. Some of the stuff in this corner in the bottom, right, we can tone down. And as you're darkening stuff, keep in mind that you want to maybe keep a little bit kind of a glow around the window panes or the panes in the uh, in glass a little bit more obvious, right? A little bit more kind of expand on them a little bit. And this is, of course, partially a slightly photographic kind of a glare and a flare, right? Um, this is a, a flare, right? That's the right word. And that is still an effect that maybe we want. Um, I think some of this, this color, whatever it is, is not necessary. I think in general, everything outside should be much more, um, just much cleaner. We do still, like we can, uh, don't, don't use the exact colors that are being used inside. And I do like particularly how the, the value of the ground and the greens and the, all that stuff is very close to the value of the sky because it's sort of like it shows how everything outside is covered. It's sort of encased in light while everything inside is encased in shadow. At the same time, we're still allowing some of those areas of light to kind of, to kind of infiltrate our interior. Right? So it's more about, once again, as I'm always I'm trying to show here, even with just a sort of a, a quick um, kind of maybe uh, just an interior, just uh, an image that spoke to you. Uh, maybe some of it is, uh, there's still a story that you're trying to tell in one, in some other way. And I am trying to get that out. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a very, like a story that's very complex. I just think it needs to be, um, it needs to be there, right? It needs to kind of to guide your actions a little bit more. I would probably do more of a gradient on the side here. Probably. Right, to get a little bit more going there. Um, some of these lighter values on there, including here. All of that can be sort of covered in light. And then some sh some sharpness down here. That allow that, that light to pass, almost show the directionality. This is very good. The, the, this bit of a kind of the diagonally uh, placed cast shadow, really helpful. And then maybe it can be a softer edge as it gets farther from its uh, the object casting it. The whole thing becomes a bit softer. And I mean, I know I said I would like to not maybe push the chromatic differences that much here, but uh, I think they're in some ways that's already happening, right? Like the dark values naturally lose chroma. Um, I don't want to kind of kill all the chroma there. Uh, I want to actually put some back in. So there's, but nonetheless, um, right, that's still, um, that's still going to happen and can add that bit of extra contrast. I, uh, oops, I'm just trying to color pick. Once again, maybe up top, I'm just going to get some, something a little bit, a little bit, softer up there it's not really like so now essentially the painting becomes considerably more abstract um and this is kind of the goal right this is what i was going for the whole time this abstracting of light and the light and the uh, and shadow this uh unification of lights surrounded by the darker values of shadows is giving you a clear design element. Um, so, right, like if we just now were to take this, um, what, what am I doing? There we go. If I were to just take this and tone this down, right, you can really begin to see, uh, I remove all of the values, you can see the kind of compositional scheme that was went into it. What was what was happening before is that it was unclear 
where the attention uh, was supposed to go. Was it supposed to go inside? Was it supposed to go outside? Everything kind of was equally, equally accented. So that's what I was trying to break apart here while still obtaining, like trying to get a certain softness um, to the environment, right? Kind of trying to get a feeling of, of light entering this room. Now, I do think, though, that possibly there's something here that could be another b bit of light. It could be something else, uh, maybe a plant, right? Maybe, and I, you know, you can keep inventing these things because maybe there's a plant, maybe it's slightly darker values. I'm not saying it should be green, uh, it could be more towards the blues, right? And there's a plant and you can see it, maybe it covers some of the, the sort of the, um, the, the squares of the, of the panes. And that would be helpful because I think the squares of the panes are getting a little bit repetitive. So kind of adding a little bit of something to break them up and then finding, maybe that's a bit too much, finding some tiny area that's really gonna be catching some of that light um, that's being cat, right? Like some of that, not to say that that's the only way to solve this, but that could be uh, something that occupies that corner. The other thing is that I personally tend to put things on top of cabinets. So um, even though I can't ever reach them, but that's just where I store them because I'm a hoarder, I would uh, possibly put something up there, maybe, um, you know, kind of a bowl or something with then, um, you know, which will maybe catch a little bit of a highlight. And then in, um, in general, behind it, we can accentuate a little bit of a shadow being cast on the wall behind it. So it's very small, some of these. Um, I'm gonna put a darker value in there, kind of showing a reflection uh, and then a little bit of light on it. On the glass in there, right? Um, something, just something to kind of, I'm not saying that it should be as blue as I did it on top. We can neutralize it a little bit. Um, but in general, right, kind of just, to, um, to to fill the room up a little bit, even though the whole point, right? It's sort of this, there's a contradiction here a little bit, right? There's the room inside where all of the details are, and yet you don't have enough distinction in terms of values to uh, to show what all that is, right? So it's, it's weird, right? Outside where all the light is eating everything up, um, we're supposed to be sort of seeing more, uh, and that would have been a, a way to do this, right? To kind of minimize the inside and accent the outside. But I think there's something complex about minimizing the outside, making that the contrast. So you want to see more but can't, and you're left back in the room uh, trying to find objects in this sort of darker, um, more mysterious area, right? There's some, there's a part of that narrative is even in that, right? It's what you tell us to look at and then also how you, um, how you, how you control what we're able to perceive in these areas, right? So you can, so there's like a game you play with the viewer. You can point, a, point the viewer in a particular direction, but then um, allow them to realize that that's actually a trap. They, they don't need to look there. They need to look inside. They need to look um, to, at a place where, you know, initially they would not have, uh, have looked. And a place that you led them away from only to bring them back, right? These, these are all, I think, important questions um, to ask when working on a piece. And I'm not saying you come up with them in advance by any means. Most of the time, they begin to appear uh, in the process of making the piece. Okay, excellent job. Let's move on. So this piece was uploaded by Parvu Kostin and um, is, if I'm not mistaken, a digital still life. And I think um, in a lot of cases, uh, places, very well executed. I have one main criticism. 
and it goes for color as well as accent. Um, and that is that everything is equally uh, accented. Everything is painted to a similar uh, completion. And each color of each object kind of exists on its own, right? It, there is no interconnectedness. Like even if I do something that, you know, that I, I can because of, uh, uh, right? Even if I do something like that, which is of course uh, a cheap way of, of, of correcting this. Uh, and by that, I mean, right? It just sort of makes everything slightly more unified by the addition of another color. I do not think that is uh, the solution, but you could see how much more unified the whole thing begins to look. Now I remove it, and um, everything sort of breaks apart. I'm looking at the cup, I'm looking at the flower, I'm looking at the leaf, the orange, uh, the grapefruit in the back, the cloth, right? Everything I can spend time with individually and not, and not even kind of worry about context. So... Is this really a problem? On the one hand, there's something interesting about paintings where this happens. Uh, I still think there should be some unity, uh, but when paintings in which this is happening, um, the, the enjoyment is in the details, right? It's all about small things. But let's see how we can maybe keep that, but make it a little bit more, um, but, still, but still, still, you know, establish some, some unity. Okay. The first thing is the background. The one thing I don't like is the fact that you could see how the lighter values all kind of, they are all around the objects. And then there's like a darkness that's creeping up around it. Um, we don't need that. I think the background needs to be kept pretty much uh, its own thing, right? It needs to have um, its own gradients. And of course, it's, you know, there's modifications that are made. Um, there are modifications that are made, um, but at the same time, see, I can highlight this and you can see it, how it highlights the upper part because it's clearly a darker value. Um, what if we get this and kind of expand and I, hmm. This also is sort of sort of what I want, right? I just want to see it appropriate that doesn't allow for too much of that. Okay, let's even kind of go with that. I mean, that's fine. Um, I would just very crudely here, I'm going to do it like this so that we can have the background as an area with, with which we can, we can play around with it. We can see where things go. The advantage of having an ability to mask things no, is like one of the main things in, in Procreate and Photoshop and all that stuff, right? So then we're here. Okay. So to work within this, what if we just take this color and flatten the whole thing out, right? What if the whole thing becomes, obviously, look at just even that. Look at how, how much the background is then pushed away and the foreground comes into play do we make this a little bit of a darker value perhaps let's start in general in general with a darker value okay now potentially in some places we can introduce a little bit of light right a little bit of a lighter value in some part and then of course maybe get a softer edge there Oh, oh, I've captured some of that. That looks awesome, but we're not going to go with that. Um, right, okay, so that's that's kind of beginning. I'm sensing a little bit more unity with some movement, some variation there. Um, possibly some darker greens yet um, on this side. Right, so there's still, I'm just, I'm getting, but the, I'm getting variation, but not around the object. So I'm not making sure. Oh, I'm not making sure that this is all a lighter value, which is 
I'm of course exaggerating this here, but that's sort of what it, what, what was happening there. Now the darks are I'm making it a darker value. It's becoming a more chromatic situation, or a more tonal situation rather. Um, what if we do the same thing but make it a more chromatic situation? That's maybe too much. Uh, keep the chroma strong, but now this, right? And um, that's also an option, right? That works with the chroma in the front, uh, and because of the flatness, um, it uh, it still works as a background. Now I'm going to stick to the more neutral color, because I think that's already where this is tending to go and where it was. I don't want to like recreate this whole thing. So I'm going to I'll leave this. I will. Uh, Color in the, all of this simply to have right in a similar way, um, at least to that, to that extent. Um, and I'm going to slightly unify the ground here, right? Oh, we're done here. I think we can find softness in some of this, right? You don't need to necessarily outline the table all the way. So that already helps. Now let's get to the objects themselves. Of course, um, we're going to need to introduce some of these colors, some of these more slightly more chromatic and slightly darker values into the transparent glass. Right, simply to have. And inside, though, all those highlights on the spools are just so intense, right? The inside. Possibly the glass is getting, you know, maybe it's totally transparent, but it's going to get them a little bit of a darker value. And that already sets that back a little bit. Um, this whole area, I'm just going to go object by object. This whole area of this pout, of this, of this kettle, is also maybe a little bit intense. Maybe uh, it has too much going on there all those reflections, what if we knock them back? What if we get rid of them just enough? Right, it's all in shadow. These other reflections, also nice, but clearly competing with the lighter values and the highlights on the cloth, right? Like the question is, what's important here? Now, I would go with the uh, opposite, the opposite idea here, right? What if we take the darker values and bring them here. So like, instead of outlining in lights, we outline in the darks instead. And extend that out so that's not so noticeable, right? That already kind of focuses our attention on the kettle, the cup. Everything is so painstakingly accurate, right? That's the sort of issue. I mean, in some ways, right? What if, I mean, I am not saying smudge or smear. Like I, I'm doing this here because that's just a way to do the critique. But um, just even getting rid of this a little bit, I'm because I don't want to uh, tell you to paint the way I paint by any means. Right? This is not the goal here. The goal is to kind of worry about the principles. And, but but just a bit of unification there can go a long way. Just a little bit of unification that can go a long way. All these reflections. All those carefully placed reflections with those tiny little highlights on this orange, or uh, are also are also a little bit um, overpowering, and this is and this is the sort of the main issue, right? Like that is an element that's farther away in the background. How important really is it to show every reflection? As you can see already, zoomed out, we're getting a much, uh, kind of a much more whole perception. The leaves. What if the leaves as well were a little bit more unified in some of these areas? So maybe some darker values, if possible. That's clearly too bright. But already, that's creating a shadow. It's more about the light than anything else. Then I think a gradient. Would be good here. What if the grays in this area, right, towards the edge of the table, would be a darker value and then become lighter and lighter as we move that way? So, already 
we're seeing this happen. I would, of course, now push some of the highlights. Right? Why not have that be a highlight? Like that can attract attention. Maybe it's not so bright, but it still should. This reflected light should be a tiny bit darker. Um, I know this is probably m my fault, but this whole edge could be a darker value. I don't think we need such distinctions between cast and core shadow on the cloth. I think the shadows in general should read, right? And especially in this front edge, they should be as clear as can be to establish that front plane. And that front plane should in general correspond to the plane of the table. Um, overall though, I see those warms in there but I would personally darken them. As much as they might seem like light, here they begin to conflict, right? I think the cloth needs to be unified in its shadows once again so that we can see it as a, as a mass. Um, and so now um, everything kind of begins to come together. It's sort of beginning to work within this environment simply by just getting rid of certain details and that already achieves this, right? That's the kind of the goal here, to achieve unity. Uh, not through a um, kind of just putting a general tone over everything, though that can in some ways, and in this case, maybe help, as we saw earlier in the critique. But uh, most importantly, it's about unity of accent. And then, and then you actually can push some of this even more, right? Now here, we can push the contrast. And let's say, right, just compositionally, that apple seems to be pretty important. We can then push the chroma, the highlights, really expand on this and make this, you know, make this stand out. The, the, this flower is important. So possibly that highlight should should stand out. Maybe it's, it's not that bright, agreed. But nonetheless, um, now we find ways to focus our attention, let's say here. Um, if this is the case, then some, let's say, th th this area of cloth maybe can be knocked back. Right? Maybe it's a darker value and you don't see such an amount of accents there, so such an amount of high contrast. Then in one or two places, we can push the contrasts so that it's not so uh, so obviously knocked back. And obviously, like this is sort of part of the painting, right? The process is like I am coming in and adding darker values, getting edges softer, kind of reorganizing the whole thing. But at the same time, what we really need is. Uh, a process which enables you to do this from the start, right? The whole point is, like, doing it the way that I'm doing it, if you were to paint this way, is in some ways a waste of time. The process itself should dictate the details, right? It's, uh, it, like, you automatically focus on the details before you... Like at the same time, like, you know where they are going to be. This is not to say that they're not subject to change, but... It's how you draw everything and then soften things, or soften everything and then pull things out, though that's closer to, to the process. The whole the idea is that you initially begin adding more information in the places where you anticipate there being more information. So um, once again, that's not to say things don't change uh, constantly. I do think this front plane, though, is a tiny bit too dark. So I'm just going to get a little bit of a light there. I think that's, I know, of course, that is a, Contrast, it's that, it's that close edge, but I don't think it needs to be that um, that much of one. And that already kind of softens the foreground and pushes us into the painting, focusing on some of those objects that I have been trying to pull out a little bit more, which are the, you know, the, the apple. All, all of this kind of is where I'm, I'm kind of moving our main focus of, uh, of attention and have been. Okay. So I think this is a great job. I think like really good job on all the details, on polishing everything. But now the question is, how does this all come together? And that's what I was trying to get at here. So um, good luck. And I definitely hope to see more, more of your work because I do think that this 
like attention to detail, the painstaking um, modeling and careful observing and really, really viewing and seeing the objects. It's all fantastic. Um, now, let's just think composition. So moving on, let's take a look at a couple of portraits. Um, this one by by uh, Ryoko, Ryoko, yeah, Ryoko Sego. There we go. Um, and um, but to kind of follow our previous piece, uh, this one too is digital. So I actually think there's some interesting things here. And the one thing I'd like to add, and this will be sort of maybe a little bit different from what I usually say, um, is that I like this feeling of natural, like there's, like there's the light is very soft, it feels natural. And there's this, uh, what I'm liking is that there is a, um, a feeling as though there's more than one source of light. So it's not exclusively um, on the, uh, coming from the side here, it's also a little bit, because kind of some reflections in, in there. I would actually maybe push that, and this is what I'm going to do here right now. On this side of the nose, maybe reduce that shadow, right? Like maybe flatten everything a little bit. Flatten, and then show hints of a, th like a little bit more of that secondary light source. The thing I like about a secondary light source, and the thing that's sort of rarely practiced, um, in art school, I think often is this idea, right? This, this like the art school often has a very controlled environment. So in terms of our lights, we're going to get a very clear shadow, terminator, core shadow, all that stuff, which is very important to learn, uh, usually a spotlight. And that's all very, very important. And I think the, that, you know, is, is, you know, something that definitely our schools need to do, you need to do in order to teach those principles. However, the thing about um, our everyday experience with other people is that we rarely find people uh, in a situation where there is only a single source of light. Maybe in the evenings uh, when, you know, all the lamps are turned off and there's sort of uh, only a single one on. Maybe that's the one situation. Uh, I'm sure that you can think of a few others, but in general, that's pretty much kind of what I usually have in mind. In real life, there's always light coming from multiple places in the house, uh, from, uh, you know, from even outside. It's reflecting off of the ground, reflecting off of the, the building uh, right next to you. All that stuff is super important. So I think this is already kind of being pushed in that direction. So let's take this in that direction even more. So I, this is sort of what I'm doing, right? I'm just kind of making sure. Now, of course, you still mainly, usually, want to keep one of your lights primary and the other one you we can, we can subdue slightly. But that, the, um, that's the, um, the way that I would uh, think about it, right? So our main lights are still here, but then we are able to still have a light on the other side without it overpowering the main one. Now, that's just something I'm going to start with. There are a few other things now that I will get to that have more to do with construction and all this stuff. And look, even then, just like slightly softening the softening all those darker values, bringing them up a little bit, already kind of helps add a certain uh, atmosphere, a certain feeling of light that in a sense was already always there. Um, I'm going to add a value and a color to the edge, right? The softness on the edge um, is important, um, but I think a color to add to that softness is also important. And I would like to just get this all a little bit softer and I personally would like to remove the majority of these individual hairs. Once again, this is only my opinion. And I think, you know, we can remove some and leave a couple. Uh, and then already we're seeing the hair more as a mass. Allow that mass to connect with the shadow on the hat. Right? Just get these things softer. Same here. 
because it's a graphic quality that you aren't really exploring. If the whole thing was like this, I get that. But there's all this remarkable painterly stuff going on down there uh, in the face, all these places. And that's just, um, I f- it feels weird to me that, that the hair is so, um, is kind of so outlined, so graphic, so delineated. I do not like that the eyes are, you know, as accented as they are, but I know that's sort of maybe the, the idea, but I also don't like that one is so much smaller and higher than the other. So what if we um, do this? Okay, we're gonna say the eyes are big and they're both gonna be that big. So, and then we can get rid of some of these things, the things I cut. And then we can knock back some of this. This is also very personal. I'm not, I just don't think that's necessary. I think this eye being mainly in shadow can just not be so shit so you know so obvious. I kind of would get rid of it entirely. Um I just knock it back and then show some smaller, darker values in there. And that and then maybe a highlight, but not a bright highlight. A highlight doesn't have to be a, a, a you know as light as um you know, just the, the, it's not the lightest value you can get. It's just the lightest value within an area. Um, and so that already sets it back, right? It's already a little bit calm. And I'm, I'm keeping it loose. Um, I'm not just not painting the eye here, but I, in general here too, right? Like, let's just make sure that maybe there's one highlight, maybe the whole thing. And then this, the whites of the eyes on this side could be a darker value. There could be some highlight that passes across there, somewhere there, a light on the form of a zygomatic, right? Just all of this can keep, can pass, and you can kind of expand on this. Um, I, I did it that way. I don't know why exactly, but, you know, sometimes I think a, an approach like that kind of works that sort of Kuribili kind of thing, right? Maybe some of the highlights on her lips, something like this. I think the form of the orbit itself could probably, this all needs to become a darker value. This all needs to become a darker value. And then the lights need to pass onto the zygomatic process of the frontal bone, right? All these things, even in something stylized, in something clearly uh, inspired by something, maybe that's not that anatomical and maybe it shouldn't be. Still needs to have some hints. Something needs to direct it. Um, keep it within within the proper margins, right? So let's knock that back. Well, but already, I think the we're kind of focused on her face. Um, I would maybe get this whole edge of the hat a softer value, right? uh, a softer edge. Um, I don't think we need that that sharp and then in one or two places you find a sharpness here too you find a sharpness right so that the whole thing i possibly this whole side becomes a darker value we knock that back i do think things are a little bit too lost on the shoulder here and that's something i would try to find it's hard to find here because i don't know what exactly we're going for but that is something to think about in that in that way and then locking it in it doesn't have to be specific but it has to be um you know to be clear enough i do think this bit of light down here oh boy this bit of light down here is a little too bright. We're going to keep the highlight at the upper margins of the eye, not at the lower ones. And in general, I mean, if I were doing this, I'd probably tone down the eyes even more. 
uh, but I'm not going to because I know that's sort of the one of the the main kind of ideas here at the beginning was to sure for the artist was to you know to push the eyes to make them your emphasis. But keep in mind when you have a pair of elements, um, you only need one of them, right? So if you have two eyes, only one has to be accented more, take precedence over the other one. So overall, I think there's a lot here that could be done that could be really, really strong and effective. And I hope I helped kind of push that, uh, push this piece in that direction. Um, because like it has all of the, has all of what we need, but it just all needed to be amplified um, and uh, homed in on. Okay. With that, let's move on to our last piece, uh, and it'll also be a portrait. Okay, so the final piece in today's critique was brought to us by Laura Espinosa, and um, I think it's kind of a cool portrait. My only concern is um, is that I feel it's a little flat. And I think that this is a quick change, quick fix. Um, I don't want to maybe, like, I don't want to really make too many alterations. I think there's this interesting compositional sort of idea, this dynamic between the light and the shadow, the black background, all that's kind of cool. But I feel like there's this really strong attempt at making things <clears throat> anatomical, but also, um, you know, kind of showing changes in plane, making things, uh, as, uh, protruding as possible in, of course, one of the hardest things to do the same to the profile. And then, um, and then, uh, so the issue is, um, is that really working? And I think in part, this is what uh, I want to focus on. So to do the classic, let's break this down into planes. And this goes as follows. We're going to see the front plane right here, right? I mean, I know it's I'm 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 it's a little bit, of course, curved. So we're going to go with that front plane there. We're going to go with an intermediary plane right here, where we're going to hit the temporal line of the frontal bone and move and march back towards the side plane here. Moving down the orbits, down to the zygomatic and going down to the corner of the mouth, we establish our front plane, which of course is also tilted. Uh, then we have our side plane of the nose with the front plane of the nose there, um, and our change of plane between side and the lower plane of the nose. Stepping down to the sort of, the closer to the bottom of the zygomatic, we're gonna then pull back and establish the plane of the, masseter, which is this muscular form there, which in combination with the upper ones we've already established, gives us the side plane of the face. Everything in between here is another intermediary. So how do we show this a little bit more? So I think it's sort of happening. So if I just take this and make it a little less opaque and then switch to our first layer, um, I think I think we can do it. The edge of the the plane change, right? That's where we're going to need to find our highlight. So right away, I'll place that, and I'm going to push it a little bit more uh, than maybe we need, right? So that's there. Um, that's our main goal here. Then a little bit more potentially on the zygomatic, and then it, there should be some hint of it on the zygomatic arch itself, passing through the hair, not allowing the hair to disrupt the form, uh, possibly some of the lighter values on the wing of the nose, and that, and, and marching down the front plane of the face. That honestly should probably solve a big deal. So let, let's take a look. That already helps round off the entirety of the, the bone. I'm going to switch, I'm going to get the, this and switch it to drawing. Uh, all right, how's this? 
bit smaller, more transparent. And I, I, I'd get some of this a little bit smoother, uh, but that depends, of course, on your preferences. And to begin to model the highlight a little bit more. I would, I'm gonna get rid of some of those dark values on the temples because I think that they, um, right, in general, uh, the side plane isn't gonna be totally in the darks here. And I think there's more connection between the frontal bone and the hair. Right? Allow these things to connect a little bit more. Here too with the hair on, uh, with all this hair and then extending these shadows as well. Like, uh, uh, yes, it's true. He's old and you probably see some of this a little bit more on him than others. But I would, in general, still, I think things are a little bit softer than what they're being made out to be here. This Now, that's not to say that we don't um, bring back some of that sharpness later. Now, I would soften the entire angle of the mandible. Um, agreed, I do think it should be shown, but possibly not uh, such a sharp angle. Um, in general, right, he's older and it looks like the mandible is, is um, right, the mandible is going to slightly change because of the erosion of the row of teeth, the alveolar ridge. So this angle is going to be slightly different, not going to be so pronounced. Um, the whole mandible kind of is a little bit higher, like it can go up a little bit higher in older people because of the erosion of the alveolar ridge, which is the row of the teeth, right? That little, the, the area where the teeth come in. I would soften the neck as I don't think we need it. I think we need to focus on the face. I think in general, I would take the ear. Um, tone it down just slightly. Maybe kind of get a larger. There we go. That's how I do it. Knock back the hair in the back a little bit. And then I would get into the nose and show some of the changes in plane between the like ailer, cartilage, um, the upper, like the ailer cartilage right here has changes in plane along the 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 bones of the nose as well as the lateral cartilage and the the uh, the wing of the nose but also knock knock back the wing of the nose a little bit All right keep in mind our highlights are on the planes that are kind of closest to us now maybe I over exaggerated the nose a little bit and knock that back um I would maybe here expand a little bit on the on the hair. We can always show individual strands of hair once the large masses are established. And so here I'm sort of just taking, I'm trying to, every, with every critique, I try to take what I think the artist is going for, right? I'm not trying to, I know this is in some ways inevitable, but I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, convert everyone. Um, I'm not trying to make everyone work like me. I'm not trying to make it look like each piece is as I were the one to do them. Um, I'm trying to get inside the head of the artist working on these pieces uh, as best I can from the pieces themselves, right? I, I don't have any conversations. I, 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 it's not a classroom. These are critiques where that I base exclusively on the work alone and what I see. And so th this is, of course, but what I'm trying to do of course, I do this in class. I definitely try to do this in class, but and I'm, but I'm still trying to do it here is try to get an idea of what was the mood, what the um, impetus for the creation of the piece is in the artist, and then my critique, um, I try to just push that as best I can. That's my goal. I don't always succeed at this, I think, because it's hard to step out of yourself. And of course, I'm going to make corrections the way that I would at times. But, um, you know, I try. Um, the eye, too, in profile, you're just going to see probably something more like this. I would even kind of push the heaviness of the upper lid. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, 
important for character. It could be effective. Um, maybe you don't see the eye. Sort of, it helps this age, right? Like the eyelids begin to droop a little with age, and that's something to consider. Um, you don't like the eye. I think is a detail that most of the time in my work, and I don't know why this is always, but sometimes I feel is like eyes kind of don't always need to be there. They only need to be there if they're expressing something particular. I think in general, there's something much more interesting with the eyes being hidden, especially because it goes against the sort of this common idea of eyes, you know, being the windows to everything and blah, blah, blah. Um, because of course they can be, uh, but a lot of times it's all eyes and uh, not much else. So there, I think that sort of helped a little bit. Um, my question is, will this gain from some darker values on the side of the lights? And I don't know. I'm going to try it. and it can kind of connect a little bit more. I think it could. I don't think it's necessary. I think we can keep the thing kind of, in, like the whole piece kind of in the gray, but there's something to be said. It has to be a little bit more, more uh, like a, something a little bit softer than what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. A little bit more nuanced maybe, um, but there's something to be said for the darks, right? The whole piece is kind of a dark and it's all in the grays. So it's the dark values and they're all in the grays. And I think this is interesting because it's kind of something to think about because the shadows on the head become lighter than the background in places. And that is an interesting approach here. I think in other places, right? They totally combine and become the background. Um, I think that could be something to think about, right? Because it's it pulls them out from the background, and yet um, uh, still keeps the piece very uh, heavy. Um, and that's sort of and that's interesting to me. This is very interesting. I think what what also can be done is now like is now to maybe darken the whole thing uh, a little bit to darken the whole thing just a bit so that our brightest values in the head um, are not appear like a, are not a, as light as they uh, initially were. This, um, we still preserve them. We still keep them the light values, but in general, um, the whole piece kind of has to be, um, you know, this, this idea of this, that this guy um, kind of submerged in shadow. That that I think is the the feeling I got and initially, and I'm just trying to kind of to work with that to to push that more. So yeah, um, I hope that was clear. I know this maybe was a little bit more more cryptic, but at the same time, I do believe that sort of the changes I made um, explain a lot of what I was trying to get at and the you know the the parts of the piece that I was trying to uh, to to b bring out more. So. Um, that's that. With this, uh, that ends today's critique, and I hope you enjoyed it. So that concludes this week's New Masters Academy critique. Most importantly, stay safe. That's the most important thing right now during this, uh, during this terrible crisis, during this very frightening time. Stay as safe as you can. Try to stay home. Once again, remember, you don't need to be a subscriber to submit a work for a critique. But also, on behalf of myself and New Masters Academy, um, I'd like to, uh, to thank the artists who have been writing critiques for other people online. Um, we're trying to get through as many artists as we can, as much work as we can, but the more we do these, the more people upload and, uh, you know, it just gets harder to to cover all that all the ground but we all know the best way to learn is to teach 
So definitely offer your constructive criticism to um, to each other. I think that could be uh, of, of extreme benefit for everyone. With that, I'll see you next time and stay safe.